It's the Ralph Nader Radio Hour. Stand up, stand up. You've been sitting way too long. Welcome to the Ralph Nader Radio Hour. My name is Steve Scrovan, along with my co-hosts, David Feldman and Hannah Feldman. Hello, David. Hello. Good morning. And, of course, we have the man of the hour, Ralph Nader. Hello, Ralph. Yeah, hello, everybody. Today, we're talking about something everybody does in one degree or another, procrastination, and what to do about it. That's right, Ralph. That's a perfect segue. In the mid-1980s, I actually did a bit in my stand-up act that was based on the film starring Arnold Schwarzenegger. It was called The Terminator, and I called it The Procrastinator. In a world where nothing gets done, Arnold Schwarzenegger is The Procrastinator. I'll be back in a little while. Just give me a couple of days, maybe a week. I'm not just thrilled to revive that classic bit. <laughs> I'm happy to report that Ralph has based today's entire program on it. What's that? Oh, Ralph has never heard about that bit? He's never seen any of my stand-up? He wants to talk about procrastination and the science of motivation? Okay, got it. Thanks. I'm happy to report that today's guest will be Pierce Steele the author of The Procrastination Equation, How to Stop Putting Things Off and Start Getting Stuff Done. This is one of our more relatable topics. Everyone here, except maybe Ralph, has procrastinated at least once in their life. Well, we've got so much to get done. Why do we put off things we know are important? Does procrastinating mean we're lazy? How can we motivate ourselves to take action? We'll ask Professor Steele. After that, Ralph will introduce a new project, the Capitol Hill Citizen Association. The goal of this program isn't just to put out entertaining and informative content every week. It's a Ralph Nader production, so we want to help you get things done. So if you're a doer, you won't want to miss that. As always, somewhere in the middle, we'll check in with our relentless corporate crime reporter, Russell Mokhyber. But first, Mark Twain once said, never put off till tomorrow what you can do the day after tomorrow. David? Dr. Pierce Steele is one of the world's leading researchers and speakers on the science of motivation and procrastination. Dr. Steele is a professor in the Organizational Behavior and Human Resources area at the University of Calgary and is the Brookfield Research Chair at the Haskane School of Business. He is the author of The Procrastination Equation, How to Stop Putting Things Off and Start Getting Stuff Done. Welcome to the Ralph Native Radio Hour, Dr. Piers Steele. Happy to be here. Welcome indeed, Piers. Listeners should know that Piers started out as a procrastinator. In fact, his first sentence under author's note is, quote, procrastination has been my life's work, both as a researcher and as a practitioner, end quote. And in a footnote, you quote your late brother saying to your uncle, quote, have you heard from Piers about his research? He has forged himself into an expert on procrastination, publishing numerous articles on the subject and being interviewed on national radio and in the press. I get a chuckle, as Piers was the worst procrastinator during his high school and college years, end quote. So first question is, how'd you get to not be so much of a procrastinator, because as we all know, everybody procrastinates to one degree or another. Anybody who tells you that they've met a non-procrastinator, my response is, well, you've just met a visiting Martian. Go ahead. Yeah, that, that's true. Wow, you really dig into my backstory there. Yeah, a lot of people say research is me-search. And so, you know, you know, physician heal thyself sort of thing. So it's where you can get, you can study anything as an academic, right? So why don't you say something that you have a little bit of energy or connection or relevance for? Fair note, I've also studied workplace violence, sexual harassment, and driving with a cell phone. So if you kind of take that across the board, I am a terrible human being. <laughs> but, but have you taken your own counsel and basically said, all this work I've done understanding procrastination in all fields of endeavor and historical context, I know I'm a lot less procrastinatory than I oh, yeah, was for sure. before. 100%, 100%. I mean, my skills, where I get my reputation from, I'm not good at everything. Of course not, no one is. But the one thing I can say I'm good at is compiling other people's research. 
organizing it, putting it together, see what's done. And you know, that actually really lends itself to book form as well as a lot of other things along those lines. But yeah, these things work. I mean, a lot of the ones are, were already there. They were scientifically studied with control groups and experiments. And if you put it all together and you've got something that works. Listeners, vowing to not procrastinate is like a New Year's resolution. It doesn't get very far. But in Professor Steele's book, just to look at the way the chapters are broken down, you can see that he really means business on this in terms of trying to get everyone to procrastinate less because devastating things happen to people's personal lives, their career, to lives of countries, to the planet from procrastination, as we will see in the discussion. So this is a very usable book, not just an erudite book, a lot of examples, a lot of motivational language. So let's get one thing out of the way. Have you ever met a precrastinator? And tell us what a precrastinator is. Oh, yeah, that's somebody who, who can't wait, right? Somebody has to do everything up front as soon as it comes along. And yeah, they exist. But that's not necessarily a good trait either, doing everything as soon as you need to. Somebody who can't schedule or can't wait for the right time. You know, you know, fools rush in where angels fear to tread. So it is not, it, it, on balance, it's better but it's still kind of impulsivity driven. So yeah, I've met a few. Right. Okay, so we can wrap up some of the questions on the minds of our listeners. Are there any differences between women and men, between young and old, between <laughs> toddlers and tweens, between comedians and stockbrokers in terms of procrastination intensity? Yeah, they are across all of them. They're, they're, none of them are quite the same. This is going to become a shocker to women out there. Men procrastinate slightly more than you. So, <laughs> yeah, go figure, right? Uh, and men tend to have uh, slightly higher issues with self-control across the board, and that includes procrastination. Um, you also see it with the young. It's development of the prefrontal cortex or the executive function. That's where your self-control comes in. To some extent, you can understand teenagers best as adults who've been, who've experienced brain damage. That is, you know, the <laughs> <laughs> brains aren't fully functioning. So, you know, they, they, they look like they're going to live forever, but really they're just living for today. You know, they, the idea of the future is very, very kind of vague concept to them. Are there any occupations or professions that work against procrastination? I'm thinking... For example, of entrepreneurs, dictators, tyrannical CEOs, do they tend to be average procrastinators? It doesn't seem like entrepreneurs can become entrepreneurs if they don't do yesterday what they should do today. Yeah, there's a weird balance there with entrepreneurs. So you have to be like a risk taking. You've got to be able to, you know, move from one thing to another quickly. So you got people like Branson, you know, who the billionaire who's really got a, got a, he's got dyslexia, he's got ADHDs, but, you know, he's charming. He makes up for it other particular ways. It really, you can get a position where if what you need to do every day, if life presents you a series of challenges and fires to put out, so to speak, somebody who is naturally a procrastinator can actually do quite well. So you can have that. You can actually have see, impulsive CEOs, but generally speaking, it's, when you need self-regulation and, you know, basically delay of gratification. Yeah, that's a really hard thing. So there's a lot of wannabe entrepreneurs. We actually did, did some work about the difference between intention and action for entrepreneurs. And it's pretty loose. A lot of people think they're going to be going into a startup or start or, you know, follow their dream. Very few people follow up on it. And that's because of procrastination. Well, let's take dictators. Local dictators, national dictators. My guess is they procrastinate too. Is that true? Yeah, uh, and everyone does to some extent. It is ultimately you know, a lot of success has partly to do with luck being in the right place at the right time. It always has been. So when you actually kind of get somebody going along, how much has it got to do with their own personal virtues? Some, but really, you, so you get all types. There's no kind of one type of dictator and some of them, same type of reasons that usually cause dictators to fall 
is the same type of reason that causes anyone. And part of that is believing, for dictators, believing your own press. Well, you know, we're going to talk later in this program about a new association we're starting called the Capitol Hill Citizen Association with citizens moving to influence Congress away from the power of giant corporations. You're a Canadian. Before we get into, you have a couple pages actually on Congress procrastinating. A lot of news articles on that over the years. How does Canada as a national government and Alberta as a provincial government stack up in terms of procrastinating? That's a good question. One of the big things is it's the structure of it. The idea of even, for example, having a two, an upper and lower house, a Senate and a Congress designed, for example, to prevent things from happening quickly. It was supposed to be a cooling. It was actually designed with human fallibilities in mind. So, you know, the, the, sometimes they call it the house of sober second thought. So you're trying to delay legislation. So because bad things can happen, you know, there's bad legislation that you don't want to get through. And so you want to stop that. But of course, at the cost of preventing a government from moving quickly, governments move very slowly by design. For us as a whole, yeah, we're kind of somewhat the same position as you, perhaps not as much, maybe because there's not as much money involved. But yeah, the first rule of a politician is to stay elected. And it's not about so much about public policy. It's about present perceptions. So yeah, I think we do better overall, but it's not designed to be perfect. It's designed not to be What about all terrible. the fires in Canada? This year was a record for wildfires oh, yeah. out of control. The equivalent of eight or nine state of Connecticut territory has been burned this year in Canada. Do you think the government, provincial and national, procrastinated anticipating this and doing something about it with adequate technology, adequate fire suppression crews, adequate listening to indigenous Canadians about how the, the natives dealt with fires centuries ago? Yeah, probably not. Um, I don't even have to go into the details. It's just we don't we're not really designed to think that far ahead. Anything that is, you know, even a few years ahead is really, really, really rare. We, you know, it's you can go up and down, you know, from education, the retirement population to, of course, environmental concerns, you know, debt. We don't look at the future very well. Even sometimes when it's, I think about the equivalent of it being a big oil tanker. And well, it could actually be a shipping tanker if that bothers you, right? But it's yeah. coming and it takes a long time for those things with that much mass to slow down. So before it even sees harbor, it's starting to break. If you wait till you actually see it with your eyes, it's too late at that point. It's got inertia. So when we actually go through these elements of, you know, how far ahead did we actually look at, we're just really not set up as a species, as, you know, in our decision making, you know, collectively or individually to make the long term real. Really, it's a flaw. It's a flaw in our design. We aren't designed for the long term. We're designed for the here and well, now. On that point, let's talk about addictions. People are addicted to alcohol, drugs, opiates, for example, other forms of addictions. Maybe if they procrastinated, they wouldn't be so harmed by their own addiction. They'd put off that drink. They'd put off that next ingestion of a pill. How do you treat people who are seriously addicted in the context of your procrastination analysis? Well, they both usually have the same route. The choice to take, you know, a, let's say, Oxycontin. At this point, everyone knows what it is. You, how could you not? How are you going to? I didn't know heroin was addictive, right? Everybody knows. So the question is, why would people do such a thing? And it comes back to the same root, actually, of procrastination, it's impulsiveness. Impulsiveness is valuing, valuing the now more than the later. So it's fun now. It gives you a lot of pleasure now. And that's the like same thing with all vices and virtues. Vices give their pleasures up front and costs later on. Virtues are the opposite. Costs up front, pleasures later on. And we're designed to value the now. 
And this was really adaptive for a long time. It's not a bad trait. It's just, if you want to get into it, we've designed a world to take advantage of every little flaw that we have in our decision-making system. We've designed a world that tries to compromise us, not elevate us. We've designed a world that, you know, tries to misinform us, not educate us. Everybody knows this. It's the outcome of, of who we are, of what makes a buck. And to the extent of addiction, I yeah, you can put a lot of it on as an individual responsibility, but there's a reason why we put candy by the checkout counter. There's a reason why all these things are emphasizing their immediate kind of pleasure, you know, what they give up front. Or when you go to a coffee shop, there's that perfectly shaped and modeled, you know, aisle of pastries. They're all designed to break down your will and to appeal to our kind of impulsive side. Let's try some real specifics. Doctors know that colon cancer can be prevented by people having colonoscopies. We've lost some dear friends recently because they kept putting off having a colonoscopy. Even though while they were putting off having one, they went to funerals of friends who put off having colonoscopy and died from colon cancer. What do you think doctors, with your advice and the public health profession, should do to get more people to have colonoscopies? Oh, that's okay. You know, I actually reviewed a paper exactly on that question. I wrote in the book how my stepmother, my father's second wife, died of that. Since then, related to it, but it would have been caught by related procedures, my mother-in-law, since then. So, you know, apparently he's not reading my book. I don't know. That's not going to help. But the idea here is people aren't going to be, they're going to think, well, this is it's the same type of problem. It's uncomfortable now. Not everyone likes butt stuff. I'm not into that myself of any sort. And it's unpleasant to get a colonoscopy for a lot of people. So that's a cost upfront. But the reward and the reward later is uncertain. So not everyone's going to get in. People are basically, as I wrote in the writing the book, they're willing to risk dying later to avoid the certainty of dying from embarrassment now. Well, do you mean you really don't have a solution to this no, problem? No, I do. I, yeah, you can, there's a lot of things you can do. First of all, you've got to make it, you can, for example, get people to sign up for a colonoscopy a year ahead. They'll discount the cost of it. So you don't want people to kind of think about, it. they got to sign up and they got to make it, make it. And then they can say, for example, that well, some people won't kind of show up, but you want to have actually kind of tied in with other kind of things that are more enjoyable, or you make the thing a little bit more you know, because it basically comes down to three variables, always three variables. It's whether it's enjoyable or not. And you try and kind of make that ease that as much as possible. Second thing, it's whether the the costs are up front or not. If you can get people to book ahead of time, that'll help. And usually what you see mostly focusing on is the rational side is the expectancy, the, you know, this is why you should do it, or this is the risks of it. I might add a fourth one. It's much easier now than 30, 40 years ago to go through a colonoscopy process. I mean, 40 years ago, I talked to a doctor and I said, what would it feel like to have a colonoscopy? And he said, well, let me put it this way. If I possess state secrets, I would have divulged them. Yeah, there you that's go. How un that's how uncomfortable. But now it's quick. It's over before you even know it under a semi-anesthesia that you're given. But you hit on something that anticipates my next question. Deadlines really help. If you actually make an appointment, which is very easy, you don't have to drink stuff to clean out your colon, just make an appointment. And you know it's hard to get another appointment if you break this one with a doctor. You're more likely to go ahead of it. So when, for example, Steve Scrovan, a script writer for the famous uh, series Everybody Loves Raymond, he had to produce because he had a deadline. He had a deadline. Or when David Feldman works with the dog Triumph, there's a deadline. So you, what about using deadlines front and center yeah, in all that, kinds that, of ways? That's, that's, yeah, we could get into that. That's a great idea. I, it, the scheduling it ahead of time, that's kind of the deadline part of it I was getting at. But you're right. I could emphasize that more. The one thing about it is something that can happen at any time happens at no time. 
they're called slippery deadlines because you can keep pushing them forward into the future uh, forever. I mean, what's another week? You know, what, I'll do this next week or next month or the month after that. And you can do that pretty much forever until it's too late. And I'll get around to it. I should do it, but, you know, not today. Tomorrow would be better, even though, you know, tomorrow is essentially in every way is identical to today. So you're going to make the same decision tomorrow. And if you think about it, if we kind of think about when you actually do stuff, when you get things done, it's well, it is just before a deadline, whether they're naturally occurring or not. You know, when do most taxes, when do most Christmas presents, when do most birthday presents, when do essays get done? When do people book tickets, you know, just before the deadline? So that's, we know that. So then if you're just kind of sitting around saying, well, why do we reverse engineer these things that cause people to do stuff, these deadlines, and you find out they have certain characteristics when they're most successful. And that's the basics of goal setting and getting people to do their own deadlines, because Deadlines take a long-term goal and make it into a short-term goal, and we respond to short-term goals. Well, we've been talking with Professor Piers Steele, who has written this book, The Procrastination Equation, How to Stop Putting Things Off and Start Getting Stuff Done, with a new step-by-step guide. But you make a, a point about how the internet and computers and iPhones and all these things are enhancing the seduction of procrastination. They actually get people to get distracted from what they're supposed to be doing, even on the computer. Yeah. Uh, while they're working, they get distracted and they procrastinate. And your book came out in 2011. I'm sure your thoughts about this kind of distraction have intensified. Can you explain? Yeah, well, it, it is. Wow. Who would have known that, that this is the world we were going to build for ourselves back when, you know, remember back when we talked about the, you know, oh, it's going to connect everybody. It's everyone's going to, you know, we're going to share knowledge. It's going to be utopian, right? It didn't quite turn out that way, did it? Let's say you're a writer or you're trying to create a class program or whatever, and you procrastinate, but some company comes along and said, look, Oh yeah, we've got a the AI, generative the AI part of it. artificial intelligence app that can that can do the job for you. Well, for and, sure. I mean, and it that's not bad. It's not. I mean, it's not a bad thing to automate part of the world. But it also is going to mean you're probably going to have a lot of labor power, negotiating power. You're if they can get a computer to do it, why do they need you for? Or if usually what happens is is that they will need people, just not as much of them. Also. Meaning that there's going to no, be a lot of What you're really saying power. is if you go to that level and try to get generative AI to do the job for you so you don't procrastinate, you're getting rid of your job eventually. Yeah, that's is exactly that it. Out? That's a bit of a catch 22. That's right. <laughs> what happens if I don't have to do my job anymore? Yes. Let's talk about the other side of that. You know, do you really think they, first of all, that job's going to come really easy? So easy, we don't really need you. So. How long well, is know, somebody going to have to take for that two plus two to run that equation? Well, that's why people need your book, The Procrastination Equation. It was very well reviewed when it came out, published by Harper's, a big publisher yeah. out of New York. And I thought the quote on the cover made it really enticing. It's by Daniel Pink, the author of A Whole New Mind. He says, yeah, he was- quote, The procrastination equation will teach you how to bust the excuses that are preventing you from doing your best work and living your best life. You'll learn some surprising facts about procrastination, as well as practical techniques for short-circuiting the temptation to dawdle. So don't put it off any longer. Read this book today, end quote. So here's a seminal question for you. Do you have people who have written you or you've been in contact who actually have said, that all this great advice worked. They don't delay much anymore. That used to happen a lot. I used to get used to like one or two a week. My question is, have we gotten to the point where your techniques are so compelling that we can actually have the equivalent of Alcohol Anonymous circles where people who are chronic procrastinators get together in a room with a leader or moderator and put your techniques to work? And then when they leave, a lot of them find that it actually does work and they don't delay as much. Yes. Are there classes like that? Yeah, they don't always credit my work, 
but yes. You lay the groundwork for practical techniques. That's right, exactly. To reduce or prevent procrastination. Are there any entrepreneurs that are starting classes in Canada and the U.S. where people pay a certain amount? Oh, yeah, and for sure. they try to deal with it? Yep. Like, I actually wanted to actually do one on one of the online courses, but unfortunately, my university didn't have an agreement with that. So maybe I should have gone for Udemia. But I've got offered to do help to kind of create workshops. And I've done, I still do workshops for different places and in, individually. So I'm well, doing Give a, us your website. How can people get in touch with you? Oh, sure. It's www.procrastinus. So yeah, I've looked up procrastination at the time, procrastinator, procrastinating, all taken. So we went with the Latin root, procrastinus, P-R-O-C-R-A-S-T-I-N-U-S.com. And of course, there's links to everything there. Well, let's go to Steve, David, Hannah. I'm sure they have some inquiries or comments to make. Steve? Yeah, thanks, Ralph. Let's talk about some of these, get down to some of these practical techniques. I know we talked about deadlines, but let's say you're, you know, you're a doctor of procrastination and I'm a patient. I come in to you and I say, doctor, I need some practical techniques. Is it list making? Is it what, what are some of these tips you would give? Yeah. And I would say, let's back up just a tick. Some of the ones, first of all, there's going to be three kind of major causes of it. As I mentioned, some of them really run it. That's the procrastination equation. It actually is an equation there. It's not just, and you can actually, it works. You can actually mathematize it, model it, and do simulations kind of, but you know, they said every equation you put in your book half the sales. So I only, I left myself a one. I couldn't afford two. <laughs> so it, it is expectancy, your self-confidence, whether you believe you can do it or not. And we all know these things. And that's why, because they're true. It, you know, everything's created twice, you know, first mentally, then physically. So I would talk about what your perception of it is and what you think about it and what you think about your chances of success. Some things, for example, you finally try them. And more often than not, it was your perception of it that caused you to delay it because when you actually did it you found it wasn't so bad and um, the next one we can do is talking about value and whether you actually haven't you know how do you experience this when are you doing it like there's a lot of things that people are doing at the end of the day when they're dead tired and they say oh, i keep putting it off i said yes because you're tired and it's something tired makes bad excruciating and then we can deal with the entire kind of impulsivity and, you know, whether rewards are you know, here and now and up front or later on and all those things. I think there's about 23 different actually techniques when you put it all together that you can do. And then I would like to know, OK, once I get an idea of who you are, then I'd like to know what you've already tried. Sometimes these things have to be stacked a little bit. None of us need another seminar on smart goals. None of us. I'm going to call a moratorium on that no more smart goals besides they even that weren't that good it was like 1982 a guy called greg doran wrote a newsletter about it it was not bad but you know the 40 years later we got better stuff <laughs> and then going along then i can actually talk about for example all right where are you working are there temptations right by you know what do you do when you should be working and you're doing something else what is that something else and i say well you know what purpose does that have to you why do you do it and is it an availability element? And why do you need to do this? And sometimes, for example, I have a lot of ones, a lot of different techniques. Some of them are fun. Some of them are harder to put into to effect. But there's ones like, for example, time blocking works really, really well. And that's giving yourself less time to do something. A lot of people give themselves more time. And when you have more time, they become slippery and you can do them all. So that time blocking is akin to creating an artificial deadline, sort of saying, I'm only going to give myself an hour to do this and see how much I can do. Or I don't want to do this actually works well and say, okay, fine. What can you commit to? 10 minutes? Can you commit to 10 minutes of doing it? I said, yeah, okay, well, let's do 10 minutes. And then you can redecide. And more often than not, at the end of 10 minutes, people decide to do more, but you couldn't get them to do more at the beginning. And you have to kind of deal with yourself as an imperfect, flawed creature and deal with the reality of that. We're not robotic angels of perfection. We have limitations. And when I actually act within my limitations, I get stuff done. Well, the whole chapter two in your book, 
is on exactly what you're talking about, titled The Procrastination Equation, the Result of 800 Studies Plus One. David? Thank you. When you're trying to move a nation as a leader, what is a more effective persuasive technique impressing upon everyone a sense of urgency or impressing upon them or reminding everybody of their shared responsibility? I'm kind of talking about climate change, which is the poster child for procrastination. We all know something has to be done, but we're putting it off. Yeah, the, I have a bit of an issue about everyone focusing on the supply side of that rather than the demand. The truth is demand side. It's if we, it's buying and using up and consuming. We're getting too rich as a world, too much wealth. And with wealth comes consumption and consumption causes all that had to be done to bring that to your door and make it. If you know, you could look at, look at all you want about production of energy and oil and all these other elements. But I, I guarantee you, if you weren't consuming it, they wouldn't be making it. And that is really kind of the ugly element. So we're going to try and, for example, create goals. Goals that are, are you do kind of, do you have, as a government, you have a few, few things like tax breaks, you can do money, you make it more valuable. Then you could actually do it in time limited saying, okay, for as long as it's being done within this amount of time, then you get a tax break. Then if you want to inspire people, you can make, you know, three-year plans, which are great, or two-year plans. But you really do, act, as you're putting, bringing up, you want to operate within the capacity of people, and people have a short-term attention span, and they can't really, some people say, don't bring up more than three things at any particular time. You have to kind of limit it, and it has to be, and this is the real thing, people respond way better to concrete than abstract. So, and this happens even like if I want to exercise. I want to exercise Saturday. And I say, you know what? I'm going to exercise this weekend. So, well, that's really great. Great of me. I, that's a good thing I should do. But all of a sudden, you know, Saturday comes and, you know, it's still the weekend. I can do it Sunday. And then Sunday comes and it's like, well, I could do it Sunday afternoon. Then Sunday afternoon comes and said, you know, I'm really kind of tired. Maybe, maybe next week. But if I said to myself, after breakfast, Saturday morning, I'm going to pick up my bag. I'm going to go to this boxing class near my place, the fitness guy. And he starts at 8.30 in the morning and he runs it through it for an hour and a half. And I'll, you know, that means I have to leave at 8.25 to get there. That's a plan. That's concrete. That's something definite that I have to do. So you have to drill it down to some specific form of action. And that action has to be something immediate that we're going to be doing, or else it's not motivation. Of it works on the supply side, too. You could have deadlines for more efficient uses of energy by the energy industry itself, lighting, heating, motor vehicles. You could have deadlines for the reduction year by year of the production of fossil fuels, leaving open more incentives to have renewables and conservation replaced the declining production of fossil fuels. Yeah, there are a lot of things like that. Hannah? Thank you. I would first like to say I'm another poster child for procrastination hanging right next to climate change as a poster of me. Let's say, you know, I have certain habits that I'll admit are procrastination, but there are a lot of things that I would also argue are just working smart, not hard. I'm using my time creatively. I need time to recharge. Practically speaking, what would you say is the difference between creative use of your time and procrastination? Yeah, that's a good question. And this is actually, I had a brief argument with Adam Grant about this, made a back and forth when he, he did his book about creativity. And essentially, incubation periods work for creativity. So you start early, you get a lot done, then you reach an impasse, then you take a break. That works. So you're taking a break. But that's not what procrastinators do. They take a break, then they try to work. That's not quite the order of operation. So everything's in there, just not in the right particular way. And you also have this element where, you know, I would be more productive later, all these conditions on it. So this is a little kind of, if we want getting back to 
neurobiology if we want we're getting to that one it's a it's you're lying to yourself and we're really good at that so we kind of tend to make decisions and then look for justifications after so you've decided to procrastinate and then you're deciding why it's a good idea now that doesn't mean for example that there can't be better you know scheduling you can totally say well there actually i would have more information or there's a chance that this project might get canceled and I'll know more about it tomorrow or you know, later on this week, and I have time after that. that to that's totally good. Their scheduling is fine. Not all of life hack can happen at once, but I'd be very careful about those two things. One is that we do have, did you do the work up front? In which case, yeah, maybe you can make an incubation argument. And the other one is that, is that did you decide to put it off and now are looking for a reason? Because that usually is not, an honest decision. I have a quick follow-up. We always hear about, you know, animal instincts and and I feel like the we usually talk about animals as being impulsive. And I never, until I read your book, I didn't think about procrastination being connected with impulsivity, but it makes a lot of sense. And I'm curious if there's an animal to emulate, if I'm trying not to procrastinate, like be like a is it like a squirrel? Squirrels have secondary nests in case one is destroyed. They plan in advance. Like, are there, is there an animal that well, you- Well, I, I, the truth animal is, animal? well, when it comes to squirrels, Hannah, just think of the daily life of a squirrel is one of fear and dread and danger <laughs> from cars, from cats, from human beings, from dogs. If they procrastinate, they're likely to die. So I think I'm going with squirrel. I think I'm going to channel a yeah, squirrel. That's a good squirrel. <laughs> they, they plan ahead. They gather things for their nest. I think I've decided for myself. You can get any animal to procrastinate, but they, in their natural environment, they rarely do. Their natural environment is perfectly fitted to their motivations. So if they eat when they're hungry, sleep when they're sleepy, and do any of their urges as they come across, they actually are normally nor really well fitted. You know, it was the Garden of Eden, the fall from grace. It's when we developed agriculture and civilization, and all of a sudden we had to plant in the spring to reap in the fall when we had four-year plans, degrees, retirement saving plans. This put a time horizon on us. That's unnatural. We have never truly evolved the capacity to... Now, we're superstars of self-control in the animal kingdom. We are. We're able to hunt and kill almost anything because we're willing to actually put in the, the delay of gratification. And that's really what makes us great. But we're still not ready for things that are even happen a year off, much less five or 10. And things like climate change, that is, that's really, really hard. All these things about what's going to happen in 2100 or 2050. Uh-uh. We don't think that way at all. You have a section in your book on the excuse that you're referring to. I'm a perfectionist, and that's okay. why I delay, because I'm a perfectionist. And yeah, very self-serving. Yeah, very self-serving. Just curious, do mammals, other than human beings, procrastinate? Elephants, primates in the wilderness? Yeah, pretty much. Pets? You can even see them in birds, and they have like this little teeny equivalent of a prefrontal cortex. So anytime you have this, it's some people liken it to that bicameral system of government. You know, decisions pass through two houses. So basically, we have a, you know, you know, some people say the three brain, you know, we have them, but it's the neocortex. It literally means new bark. So it allows us to make plans, vague plans for the future. Mammals other than humans procrastinate? Yeah, yeah. You can see it in dogs. Of course, apes, they do pretty much everything we do. it, And you know, they've even this entire area about, you know, actually, actually preceded my, I think I said, I said, you know, birds, rats, and even the Congress procrastinate. <laughs> I've always thought corporations have developed the most refined solution to procrastination mm -hmm. on a wide scale. It's called the assembly line. Oh, how so? Because when you're on the assembly line, assembling cars, for example, or other manufactured products, you can't procrastinate a minute. That's right. You can't. They were never going to all the way back to Charlie Chapman in modern times. Yeah. Right. That's right. You have a section in your book on 
speed up of assembly lines and efficiencies. Yeah. Well, this has all been very interesting. Can you give your website again before we conclude? We're yeah, speaking I, with I, Professor I, Piers Steele, author I, of the I, book, I, The Procrastination Equation. You can Google my name. I am literally have the world's most searchable name. You know, it is unique. There is no other Piers Steele's in the world. Now, you can't prove a negative, but there may be somebody somewhere. But he's certainly not making himself known to me. But that'll get you there. But it's if you want to go directly to the site, just go to procrastinus.com. Thank you very much, Press Steele. You will never run out of the need for what you have devoted your life's work for. Procrastination may indeed be on the tombstone for the planet Earth. Thank you again. Yeah, we'll talk more about this later. We've been speaking with Pierre Steele. We will link to his work on procrastination. And we're not going to put it off. It'll be at ralphnaderradiohour.com. Up next, Ralph has a new call to action. But first, let's check in with our corporate crime reporter, Russell Mokhyber. From the National Press Building in Washington, D.C., this is your Corporate Crime Reporter Morning Minute for Friday, September 8, 2023. I'm Russell Mokhyber. Wells Fargo will pay $35 million to settle charges of overcharging more than 10,000 investment advisory accounts, more than $26 million in advisory fees. The Securities and Exchange Commission alleges that certain financial advisors from Wells Fargo agreed to reduce the firm's standard preset advisory fees for certain clients and made handwritten or type changes on clients' investment advisory agreements that reflected the reduced fees at the time their accounts were opened. However, in certain instances, the account processing employees at Wells Fargo and its predecessor firms failed to enter the agreed-upon reduced advisory fees into the firm's billing systems when setting up the client's accounts. For the Corporate Crime Reporter, I'm Russell Mulcahy. Thank you, Russell. Welcome back to the Ralph Nader Radio Hour. I'm Steve Scrovan, along with David and Hannah Feldman. And Ralph, of course. Stand up. There's a new opportunity for members of our Congress Club and many others who are not members. We're forming a new informal association called the Capitol Hill Citizen Association, CHCA. And we'd like the members of our Congress Club to put the Congress Club on pause with us and elevate to a more personal connection with your members of Congress by becoming a Capitol Hill citizen. And here's how it would work. If you want to become a member of the Capitol Hill Citizen Association, you need to donate $5 or more for the most recent issue in print only of the Capitol Hill Citizen. It was talked about many times, the 40-page newspaper on Congress. And further, donate $5 or more for five other copies of the Capitol Hill Citizen to give to your circle of friends, workers, relatives, or neighbors. So you become a spreader as well as a focal point on your two senators and representatives. And since the Capitol Hill Citizen is not online, print only, Capitol Hill Citizen Association people get exclusive access to the Capitol Hill Citizen Action of the Month. And the Capitol Hill Citizen Association will print the Action of the Month on the same page of its 40-page. Here's the first Action of the Month, and it's very fundamental. You write either your senators or representative and ask them to send you a print copy, not online, a print copy of the Congressional Record, which comes out daily when Congress is in session. That is the record of all the debates, discussions, legislation, and the various inserts that members of Congress put into their appendix on behalf of constituents' uh, requests. So uh, a lot of the inserts are just, you know, someone wins a prize in a high school graduation, but others are serious articles in newspapers back home pinpointing a problem. They'll put it in the congressional record and then you can get cheap reprints to distribute under a congressional record masthead throughout your community. So ask your member of Congress to send you one of the recent daily congressional records in print so that you can understand in a more granular form what's going on in Congress. 
That's the first action of the month. They'll be quite impressed. Very few people ask for a print edition of the congressional record. Very few people even look at it online. But it's a fascinating verbatim rendition of a lot of what Congress does that's public, at least, on Capitol Hill. Let me back up here for a second, Ralph, and make sure that I understand. So if you donate $5, you get the most recent issue. And if you donate another $5, you'll get five more issues sent to you that you can pass along? No, it's $5 per issue, a total of $30 in terms of a donation. And this is a publication that doesn't take any paid ads, and it's going to increase its impact on Capitol Hill. Every issue that's printed is delivered personally to every office of every member of Congress and all the major committees and subcommittees. So it would be $5 to get your own copy and five more at $5 each to distribute and spread the word to your own circle of friends, relatives, neighbors, and co-workers. That way we get an expansion of your effort back home, as well as a very personal connection to what's going on in Congress by reading the fascinating pages of the Capitol Citizen. So $5 for your own issue, $30 for six issues, one for yourself, and five more to pass along to others. That's correct. And that way, Capitol Hill Citizen Associates will be encouraged to get their friends whom they get the papers for, that is the Capitol Hill Citizen, to join also, and it begins spreading from their efforts as well. We have to put a dynamic factor in this effort, which was not really present in the Congress Club effort that we started a couple years ago. And that dynamic effort is the specific action item. Every month there will be a suggested action of the month, and you can pursue it in your own community, on your own two senators and representatives, or any member of Congress who happens to be in the spotlight on the issue, the subject of the action of the month. All this, uh, listeners, will be declared very clearly on the website that we will specially establish so that if you don't catch it right now, you can go to the website, Capitol Citizen Association. So, for instance, for this action item of getting the congressional record, so I write, I say I want a print copy, and say the congressional office comes through and I get a print copy of the congressional record. What then? Well, you say print copy, not online. You have to specify, not online. That's not going to help grab the attention of your member of Congress. It's the request for a print copy. They get all kinds of print copies. There's no problem there. And that's the action of the month. The action of the month is you become a reader of their record, their public record. And all kinds of ideas will come to you, all kinds of motivations, all kinds of dismays. Uh, and you, you educate yourself. So that's the first action of the month, is self-educating yourself about the printed version of the daily congressional record whenever members of Congress are in session, which is only about one out of every three days throughout the year. I'm sure, Ralph, people will ask, why just print? Why? I know you've talked about this before previously, but let's reiterate, why is it important that it's something you can't get online First and that point, is only yes. in print. Why print? One, there's no distraction. You're online, you're all kinds of distractions. I don't have to tell you what they are. The second, you don't get the attention of the members of Congress in their office. When you ask for a print copy, you become a discussion in the office. They know about it. They don't know about it if you look at it sporadically online. The third is that it enhances your sense of possession as a reader. You flip through it, you put it on the table, you show it to members of the family. You might want to take it to your local school library and ask them to subscribe or your public library and ask them to subscribe. It's much more effective to do it when you're holding a print copy than when you email a library and say, why don't you subscribe to the congressional record? Because the online version is not really getting much attention. I agree with you about the congressional record being unreadable online. It's unfriendly. It doesn't allow you to scroll. 
and search properly. It's a frozen PDF, so you might as well get it. And it goes to your earlier point, David, that once you read the congressional record, you hear about certain hearings, and you say, I want to copy that hearing, which decades of people who preceded you used to get free from their member of Congress, a printed hearing. I used to get it as a teenager from my senators from Connecticut. And you don't get that when you just are scrolling through the online version. And then when you're told that there is no printed record, they don't print it anymore, the transcript is delayed, then you got an action of the month, don't you? Which is, what are you doing, blacking out the public? For over 200 years, the government printing office printed all these hearings and committee reports, and now you're not doing it anymore? What's your game plan anyway? Autocracy on Capitol Hill? See, it leads from one to another. It leads from one, one demand, one level of awareness to a level of demand to a level of dismay and indignation, which are the, the sources of civic activity, especially when you have the knowledge possessed by you because you have read the congressional record. I mean, just writing your member of Congress to say, you know, on page 48 of the September 26 congressional record, I noticed that you had a part in a speech on the floor regarding a bill, and I don't like what you said. Well, you don't think that penetrates the office there? You almost become a singular topic of discussion. They say, oh, this person's really serious. We can't get rid of this person with a form letter. So just following up on this congressional record, because I've never read the congressional record, gotten a copy of it. If they did fulfill this print congressional record, how thick of a tome do I expect to get in the mail? It could be anywhere from a quarter of an inch to a half inch to an inch, sometimes even a little more if they're introducing a lot of material as part of congressional debates. It's a pretty thick magazine, and it comes out every day that Congress is in session. Steve, when I was a teenager, I stumbled on the congressional record piled up in my middle school library. And I said, what is this? And I, I took it to the librarian, and she said, it's the congressional record. We just don't have room on our shelves because it comes in every day. And they used to work many more days in Congress than they do today. And so I became a regular reader. And then I said to myself, well, I'd like to get this in the mail every day. So I contacted my senator, and I learned something very interesting. They were given a quota of at least 100 subscriptions that they give out free to their constituents. And so I asked my senator, I want to be on the list to get it regularly. And I got it for years and came in the mail. All that's gone now. There is no quota. The subscriptions nationwide to the congressional record, the most powerful institution in our republic, is down to 1,500 print editions. 1500. And from what I hear, there aren't that many people who are reading it online. Now, members of Congress, they don't mind that. They don't really want people looking over their shoulder as to what they're doing in Congress, even what they're doing publicly, because what they do publicly is often against the people's interests and in a thraldom to these corporate lobbyists that swarm over Capitol Hill in person. They don't do that online. They lobby in person. Anna, did you have an observation or question? I do, Ralph. If I'm not mistaken, I seem to remember when you first launched the Congress Club, you brought up the Procrastinators Club of America. And building off of our guest today, it sounds like this is kind of an anti-procrastinators club, that you're using some, trying to use some of the strategies that we just discussed to get people to set deadlines, to build in the sense of mutual accountability. And, and is that kind of in line with, with the goals yeah. of, of the new club? Yeah. Hannah, that's a wonderful connective point with our prior guest, Professor Piers Steele. More people will listen to what we just said about becoming part of the Capitol Hill Citizen Association and say to themselves, I'm going to get around to do that, than actually the number of people who do it listening to the program in a prompt period of time. So it would be very good to listen to Professor Steele's suggestions and read his book, because 
We cannot afford procrastinatory citizens. We have a procrastinatory Congress, and the citizens have got to get them to anticipate, to foresee, to forestall so many of the omnicidal urgencies that are coming at our country and other countries around the world. Good point. Okay, so just to reiterate, if you want to become a member of the Capitol Hill Citizens Association, you just donate $5 or more for the most recent issue and donate five or more for five other copies that you can pass along to your peer group. Stand up. I want to thank our guest again, Piers Steele. For those of you listening on the radio, that's our show. For you podcast listeners, stay tuned for some bonus material we call The Wrap-Up, featuring Francesca DeSantis. And in case you haven't heard, a transcript of this program will appear on the Ralph Nader Radio Hour Substack site soon after the episode is posted. Subscribe to us on our Ralph Nader Radio Hour YouTube channel. And for Ralph's weekly column, it's free. Go to nader.org. For more for Muscle Mo Kyber, go to corporatecrimereporter.com. The American Museum of Tort Law has gone virtual. Go to tortmuseum.org to explore the exhibits, take a virtual tour, and learn about iconic tort cases from history. We have a new issue of the Capitol Hill Citizen out now. To order your copy of the Capitol Hill Citizen, Democracy Dies in Broad Daylight, and to become a Capitol Hill Citizen, go to CapitolHillCitizen.com. And remember to continue the conversation after each show. Go to the comments section at RalphNaderRadioHour.com and post a comment or question on this week's episode. We read them all. The producers of the Ralph Nader Radio Hour are Jimmy Lee Wirt and Matthew Marin. Our executive producer is Alan Minsky. Our theme music, Stand Up, Rise Up, was written and performed by Kemp Harris. Our proofreader is Elizabeth Solomon. Our associate producer is Hannah Feldman. Our social media manager is Stephen Wendt. Join us next week on the Ralph Nader Radio Hour. Our guest will be David Hemingway, director of the Harvard Injury Control Research Center to discuss gun violence as a public health crisis. Thank you, Ralph. Thank you, everybody. Remember, go to CapitalCitizen.com to be part of the Capitol Hill Citizen Association movement.